Hey everyone, Hydrahead here. And uh, today I'm going to type something a little bit different. I actually decided to script a review for once instead of uh, just freeballing it. So if you actually make it through it and you have any comments, feel free to leave them at the end and let me know what you think. If you don't like it, you can feel free to tell me. <clears throat> so anyway, this is The Immortal Men from the New Age of Heroes. This is by DC Comics. Um, I've talked about one, I've talked about two. Uh, on art and writing, we got Benjamin. Well, on writing, we have Benjamin. I believe he's just doing like plot and story structure. Or, I'm sorry. I believe Benjamin is writing, and I think Tinian is handling the uh, just the plot and story structure. And we got Friend and Baron on art. So, overall theme of this book, initially, I thought this was going to be DC's take on the X Men, and it was really panning out that way in books one and two. But now that we've reached issue number three, it's become blaringly apparent that this is in fact a caped version of the Matrix. And you'll see what I mean in this. So the issue essentially picks up where the last issue left off. Uh, though I think in a trade setting it will feel a little disjointed and unnatural. The reason for that is because we start off with an internal monologue that uses exposition to try and catch the reader up on what's happening. Unfortunately, if you're not familiar with 1 and 2, then this probably won't help you to really understand what happened. But it does work as an okay reminder for those of us who are waiting for a month between chapters. Um, also, I think I must misspoke when I said an internal monologue. It's really presented more like an internal voice, but it's very much a narrator. Which is probably why I find it annoying that it beats around the proverbial bush so much. <coughs> As we're uh, moving to the next scene, we find our main character, Caden Park, waking up on a mattress laying on the floor of a basement in some mysterious place. Handling the situation like a champ, Caden doesn't freak out and assume these people are going to rape him, because that's my first impression would be uh, if I woke, woke up locked up in a dingy basement and a bunch of dudes standing around me drinking. But no, Caden handles it like a trooper. <clears throat> we find out in uh, this scene here what Caden's power is, it's basically mind swiping, and it's uh, controlled by human contact, or it uh, activates through human contact. What I'm led to believe this means is Caden can see everything you're thinking and what happened in your life via touch. So far it's not been explained well, so I could be way off base. Who knows? I sure don't. This is also where I finally realized that this is in fact a Matrix remix featuring Caped Crusaders. It's exciting, I know. We find, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> this is where we start to learn a bit more about some of the other immortal men, though, uh, beginning with Ghost Fist. That's this guy here. Turns out we're now in an abandoned building in Harlem, and that used to be a speakeasy during Prohibition. But then learn that Ghost Fist used to, oh, I'm sorry, we then learn that Ghost Fist used to be a Cape Crusader, protecting the people of Harlem back in the day. They illustrate this by showing us a nice spread of some uh, mobsters shooting random blacks in a crowded street, which you can see here. I actually find this kind of ironic, though, because in the early 1920s, Harlem was still a majority Jewish neighborhood. Uh, the 20s was when they also were really moving out because the local government had turned the neighborhood into low-income projects, which dropped property values of the existing homes and in turn forced many previous residents to essentially flee the area. But, we'll just pretend Harlem was always, <clears throat> has always been a black neighborhood because it's the only way for the story, well, for Ghost Fist's story to really make sense. It's funny how that works. Next we meet the second, <laughs> next we meet the second Morpheus. Uh, I mean, the Immortal Man. He's one of the five oldest beings in existence. As a side, this is a rather annoying thing that Marvel Comics does, and it's unfortunate that DC is going to carry on the torch. But just because someone is old, smart, etc., it doesn't mean that they have some idea of where they stand on this imaginary global scoreboard. You can use exposition to add gravity to someone's abilities, or in this case, age, without having to resort to, oh hey, he's one of the oldest humans in existence, he is. Regardless though, we finally learn some history about the immortal man from his very own mouth. We find out that he grants the world's greatest heroes with a small piece of his immortality. 
they don't explain how this is supposed to work or if he has a finite amount of immortality. We do know he ends up, uh, and I'll get to this in a little bit, but he ends up with 300 students. Um, and it doesn't appear to have affected his immortality, or maybe that has something to do with his white hair we see. I don't know. Maybe we'll learn more. Not in this issue, though. This is also where we learn a bit more about the other heroes on the team, though. Timber, our grow big Native American, is in fact Paul Bunyan. You know, the American folk legend that created the Grand Canyon, clear cut Central America, finally walked to Western America to retire in the redwoods with his big blue ox. Well, that's all wrong. And it's wrong because of the prejudices of man. The immortal man tells us so. Timber is the real Paul Bunyan, and Babe is her big blue axe. And you're all a bunch of stupid misogynists for thinking she was ever a man. Next, we have Stray. Let's get a little bit better picture of that so you can see what Stray looks like. Actually, it's a terrible picture of Stray. <laughs> uh, she's a bipolar wildcat, essentially. Apparently, she was in a United States military base in Japan, of all places, in the late 1990s. She, of course, chose to remain, even though she was being tortured, just so she could sneak out the other test subjects. So brave. Much wow. <laughs> Moving on, we also had three other students that we're not going to really learn any about, anything about, but they all died in a great battle. Uh, which we're kind of told in a rather blunt sense. And the uh, battle, we find out, was waged by... <coughs> I'm sorry. Waged by monsters created from the corpses of fallen warriors, consumed by their lust for battle. These undead soldiers were, of course, harvested from the death fields, the death fields of Stalingrad and Gettysburg, from rodent legions and Mongol hordes. To me, this is kind of implying that all the people who died in those particular battles were there for no other reason than to kill. Which is absolute and total fucking bullshit. But, they didn't specifically bring up Nazis, so I gotta give them credit for not taking the lowest hanging of fruit. Still though, educate yourself on the reasons behind great battles. It's not just so a bunch of dudes can go out there and flex nuts and kill each other. There might be some out there for that reason, but it's not the greater purpose. Uh, we then skip any thought of a proper segue and immediately jump into the exposition for the Batman Who Laughs. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm seriously looking forward to reading about the ultimate evil. As written by a guy who just called me a toxic man for knowing nothing about, or for not knowing that Paul Bunyan was in fact a giant female Native American who wasn't a squaw for some reason. Now then, <clears throat> anyway, we get a bunch of... Uh, not even a bunch, we get a shitload. A subtle exposition that takes a roundabout way of telling us our main villains once, or telling us that our main villain wants an all-out war, and Laughing Batman is helping them to create an ultimate weapon. Essentially sums that all up. We jump scenes, yet again, <coughs> to find our boy Reload. I'm skipping this blood guy, because you can... This little scene here, I'm skipping for some specific reasons. You can uh, you can read this and find out yourself if you want. <laughs> so we uh, jump scenes again to find our boy Reload, locked up in some other basement, being questioned by a character we met in the last issue. He has a uh, kind of a dumb name that I can't for the life of me remember right now. Hunt slash something obvious that you'd be like, well, that's kind of a given name. Um, yeah. Anyway, enough of the digression. Uh, we'll learn that Reload and Hunt Slash fought in Vietnam together. Which is uh, actually happening right over here. And, of course, had a uh, <coughs> differing, differing opinions on the war and the reasons why they were there. Reload wants to prevent battles and Hunt Slash feels the immortals need to use their powers to force the mortals into more battles to further their development as a people. This is probably the most interesting dynamic the story has introduced so far, because both people actually have a strong place to argue their point from, but we don't get into any of that. Uh, we just learned that Hunt Slash, because I don't know his name, that's just what I'm going to call him, <laughs> is wrong for reasons, and Reload is morally correct 
which is the most important thing in life, as we all know. With any luck, though, the writer will dive more into this later on, uh, just before changing scenes. Yet again, though, <clears throat> we learn that they aren't actually after the immortal man. The villains want to know why our main, Caden Park, is so important to the immortal man. Scene switch! Mm -hmm. Back in Harlem, shit's just about to hit the fan. Stray notices intruders are coming. The immortal man asks for Ghost Fist assistance. But alas, his powers are being dampened and their quick escape is blocked. Looks like the only thing left for our exalted heroes to fight. Well, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Looks like the only thing left for our exalted heroes is to fight. Uh, but that's coming up next issue. And uh, if you guys want to see the last page, I'm going to show it in five. Four. Oh, if you don't want to see the last page, then go ahead and just click on out of here. But if you do, five, four, three, two, one. Tee hee. You guys go. It's pretty exciting. I know. I really like the costume on her, and her sword's pretty cool. Um. The lines around her mouth, I really could have done without. It just makes her look like she was snarfing down into some food and didn't have a chance to wipe her face off. Up close, it doesn't look bad, but at a distance, not a huge fan. Anyway. So that's my review on Immortal Man 3. Um, I didn't really like the first issue. I enjoyed the second issue far more. The third issue, I felt, was pressing some some pointless PC ideals that really didn't need to be expressed. But it's on my poll. I haven't taken it off yet. I'll go ahead and give four a chance. If it gets worse, then I'm just dumping it. Um, there's still a couple of good ones on the Immortal uh, or on the uh, New Age of Heroes that I'm reading. Oh, also covered by Jim Lee, which is fucking awesome. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Go Hydra, baby.